I was hanging out with Pastor Chad backstage and he's like, hey, the song's over, it's your turn to go out. So <laughs> we wanted to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity. Uh, well, if, so here's what I wanna ask you to do. If you're happy to be here today, I want you to clap your hands. Now, while you're sitting, I want you to stomp your feet and clap your hands at the same time. I just wanted to see if you would do it. Now jump up and turn around and sit back down. Just kidding. Well, it is so good to, to, thank you. It is so good to be here, to see you in person. Thank you for joining us online. Hey, and we just want you to know as you're watching us online, we're gonna continue to show and stream online. We believe that God has called us to reach the ends of the earth. And we believe that streaming our services is the very best way to do that. So as you're watching us online, share, watch parties, comments, do everything that you want uh, to increase our footprint in the online world. Uh, we all acknowledge it has been a tough journey for some. We, we acknowledge that some people have lost their jobs during this time and hopefully uh, we're seeing hiring increase and perhaps there people are being hired and they're finding their jobs. We've seen some businesses shut down, but we've seen also some businesses thrive and today we're just blessed to be able to gather together. Uh, you can shake hands if you want to. You can look somebody in the eye and make eye contact with them, with them if you want to. And don't worry if you make eye contact, the coronavirus cannot spread through eye contact. <laughs> eh, it was funnier when I thought about it. We are continuing in our sermon series from the book of Acts. Pastor Chad spoke from Acts chapter four last week. And this week we're continuing in Acts chapter three, verses one through 12. Uh, let me encourage you, if you've not yet read through the book of Acts, Acts is a fascinating book of the Bible. It's a story of the apostles. It's a story of the Holy Spirit moving. It's a story of the early church growing and learning how to adapt to challenges. And uh, it's incredible and it's extremely applicable for us today because just as we saw the Holy Spirit move in the lives of the men and women 2000 years ago, I firmly believe that the Holy Spirit wants to move in your life and my life in the very same way. So read the book of Acts. You will love it. Uh, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, our main passage of scripture is Acts chapter three, verses one through 12. If you do not have a Bible, you can use uh, the Bible located underneath, underneath the seat in front of you. I've, it's been a while since I've said that. Underneath the seat in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible at your house that you can read and understand easily, I want to welcome you. Take one of those Bibles home with you. It is yours. It is our free gift to you. You don't have to tell us that you're taking it. You can just take it. It's, your, it's a gift from us to you. We're going to be on page 1083 in the Bible underneath the seat in front of you, or it could be in your hand right now. So uh, let's read together Acts chapter 3 verses 1 through 12. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. If you don't know what alms is, that's he wanted money. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. Isn't that like a preacher? But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk? 
Then if you're following along, you know that Peter continues to preach a pretty lengthy sermon. And so one by one, we're gonna go around the room and share a verse, I'm just kidding. It's a pretty lengthy sermon and we're gonna look at the end of his sermon in just a few minutes, but now I want us to focus on the man who was healed. Now, again, a little synopsis, uh, a little synopsis in case you, you missed it. Peter and John are, way, are on the way to the temple around three o'clock for prayer. Just outside the temple sat this crippled man, crippled since he was born. And he was just sitting there waiting for these churchy people to give him money. Can I tell you, that's just a genius crippled man. I mean, it's just genius. If, he, if you don't have time and you're on your way into the temple for worship and you're rushed and you're hurried and you walk past him, he knows he's gonna get you on the way out because now you've been worshiping and you're saying, oh God, use me. Oh God, change me. Oh God, let me love like you love me. And you walk out of the temple and there's a man asking for money. It's perfect. He was a genius. He was sitting right there. Now we don't know how old he was, but we do know that his condition prevented him from being able to lead a normal life. He had to be carried to the place where he was now. So really, if he was gonna be going anywhere, he basically had to drag himself through the streets or wherever he wanted, except he had somebody that would carry him to the temple gates. Now, most likely that meant he was not married. He probably didn't have children because during this time period, if you were crippled or blind or paralyzed or diseased, you were considered an outcast. You weren't really allowed to interact much with society at all. And so good luck trying to find somebody that would marry you, right? And so he was really, from the time of his birth, he was rejected. He was an outcast. Uh, the friends didn't play with him on the playground. He was alone and isolated really from the world, but his life was about to radically change. So Peter and John, they look at him and they said, look, buddy, we don't have any money, but what we do have, we give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. And then, Peter took him by the hand and as the man rose to his feet, his feet and his ankles or whatever was wrong with his legs were healed. So that meant to the man, no more begging for food, no more depending on other people to cart him around town, no more dragging himself through the city streets. In that moment, in that instance, he was changed forever. He was made better. He was a new person and that newness was going to last the rest of his life. It was a miracle. So how does that relate to you and I? Well, if, if you had a moment where you experienced that life-changing power of the good news of Jesus, you know what it's like to experience life all over again. If you have thanked Jesus for paying the penalty for your disobedience to God, if you thanked him uh, for dying on the cross for you, if by faith you believe that you have been forgiven for your sins, if by faith you believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that one day he's going to return, if by faith you took a moment and you received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and committed to follow him, then you know exactly how this man felt. You know why this man was jumping up and down. You know why this man was filled with excitement. You know why this man was celebrating. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. That is awesome. I mean, that is a message of hope. That is a message of freedom. That is a message that people in this world today need to trust in. That when you receive Christ as your savior, your old life is dead. It's gone and a new life has begun. Before you and I became a follower of Jesus, we were just like that crippled beggar. 
We live crippled by sin in our thoughts and in our minds and in our actions and in our attitudes. Everything that we did, everything that we inter- everybody that we interacted with was impacted by the sin that kept us from a relationship with God. We were crippled by shame. We were crippled by guilt. We were crippled by hopelessness. We were crippled by doubts. But when we became a follower of Jesus, When we received Christ as Savior and committed our life to him, we, just like this man, were made new and we were set free. We were set free to follow Jesus. We were set free to show grace to other people. We were set free to hope. We were set free to believe that the very best days of our life are ahead of us. We were set free to experience the overwhelming never ending, breathtaking love of God found through Jesus. So as we remember what we have been rescued from, as we remember what our old life what was once like, we should look at the example that this now healed cripple man provides to you and to I. I think that followers of Jesus should celebrate life change hard. I think that followers of Jesus should celebrate life change hard. Look at Acts 3 verses 8 and 9. It says, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. I think there's a few stages in there that's important for us to look at just very briefly. So we see that as he was walking, that meant he was healed, right? We could see, oh, he was crippled, but now he's walking. But he wasn't only walking, he was leaping. This shows us that this man's legs now had strength. You know how I know it takes strength to leap? When was the last time you leaped? (laughs) Right? I mean, I've hopped a couple times with the girls in the house, but I don't know about leaping. This man's leaping. He's showing, look, I'm using the legs that were once crippled and I'm not just walking, but I'm leaping. Right? I'm going as high as I can and I'm coming down to the ground. He's leaping and then he's praising. This shows us that it was Jesus that was credited for the life change. It wasn't the Peter and it wasn't John. He was worshiping God. He was saying, look, the Lord worked through these men, but I'm praising God because he has healed me, Jesus of Nazareth. The old crippled man was gone. The new man with strong feet and legs was there and he could not, been, could not have been any happier. He celebrated and he celebrated hard. Now, I've only been in Havasu a year and a half, but if there's anything that I've learned about the culture of Havasu and Parker and this little pocket of Arizona is that whether you're born again or whether you're not, everybody seems to know how to party. (laughs) Everybody likes to celebrate, right? They party on the water. They party in the desert. Uh, they, people like to party, celebrate, and gather with friends. If you don't believe me, go down to the uh, Rotary Park and just take a look out in the water. Uh, people are celebrating. People are gathering. There's born-again followers of Jesus out there, and there's unsafe pagans, and they're all just out there partying. They're, they're just partying. Now, growing up, I did not celebrate well. Uh, I I look forward to celebrating my birthday and Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving and Halloween, just like every other kid does and did. But those days of excitement, once that day hit, I was always crushed with disappointment. I'm saying this not so you like feel sorry for me. I'm just telling you the truth. Like we would look forward, say to my birthday and I'm counting down the days and I can't wait. But early on in the morning of my birthday, my dad would begin to drink. And by mid-morning and mid-afternoon, he would be pretty wasted. And by mid-afternoon, he would be hurling names at me and calling me names and insulting me and uh, yelling at me and not letting me open up the presents or smashing the birthday cake on the floor. 
And so there were very rare birthdays that I celebrated that I didn't end up crying in the closet somewhere. And so it had an impact on me. And even as an adult, I realized I don't do a good job celebrating well. I'm reserved. I I hold back because I think there's a little bit of fear that I have that I'll just be disappointed or I'll, I'll just be let down. So even though I've been made new, my celebration is not very visible. I internalize a lot of celebration. I recognize that about myself and I don't like it and I want to change. At Calvary, we really seem to celebrate well. Uh, We love celebrating here. We celebrate baptisms, right? We cheer and applaud every time somebody comes out of the water. We celebrate when marriages are redeemed and rescued and we we share their stories and videos so other people can be encouraged and receive hope. and, and, And we celebrate that. We celebrate stories of people being rescued from addictions and have now a new life in Jesus. We celebrate generosity as we talk about raising money for wells in Africa or raising money for Compassion Center or just about what God is doing through you guys here in Havasu through our benevolence. We love to celebrate and shine a spotlight, not on what Calvary's doing, but on what God is doing. Just like this man was healed by Peter and John, that man was not praising Peter and John. That man was praising Jesus. And so we try to shine the light on what God is doing and celebrate. But I would love it if we celebrated more. You know, I would love it if we as as a church celebrated more. I sometimes wish that our voices were louder in worship. I, I sometimes wish that our voices were so loud that we drown out the band that Jesse and the band would be up here going, man, we can't even hear our instruments. You guys are singing so loud. You're celebrating so hard. I sometimes wish that our applause and our cheers would linger longer for those who are baptized or for those that are, are, we're watching their testimonies. I sometimes wish that it would just last just a few seconds longer. And I'm not talking about that fake kind of celebration, right? That we're all guilty of, right? The, oh, oh, that was good. I wasn't even paying attention, but I, oh, that was great, right? I'm not talking about that golf clap kind of celebration. I'm talking about that unharnessed enthusiasm for the work that God is doing in people's lives. And the reason that I sometimes find myself wishing for that is I recognize that hard celebration draws others in to listen. Hard celebration draws others in to listen. Now look, this man, he was hooping, he was hollering, he was leaping, he was shouting, he was praising God. And as he did that, all the people who were outside came rushing in to see what on earth the commotion was all about. Acts 3.11 says, all the people utterly astonished ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. That means they all heard it and they went rushing. The people who heard the celebration, they were curious about what had happened and they ran together and surrounded the man, Peter and John. When you and I celebrate our faith, Those without Jesus, those on the outside of our faith will grow curious. The more we celebrate our faith, the more visible it is, the more people around us will begin asking questions as they see us living out lives that celebrate grace, redemption, forgiveness, healing, second chances and hope they are going to grow more and more curious about this Jesus that changes lives. See, the way that we celebrate draws others in because people love to party. They, they want to, hey, what are you, what are you uh, celebrating? What's going on here? People love to have a good time. People love to celebrate. If you don't believe me, stand up in a restaurant the, uh, the next time that you're in, tell people it's your child's birthday and ask them to join you in singing happy birthday to them. They will, they'll join in. They might get a little bit annoyed at you first standing up because they're like, what does this guy want? And they say, hey, I wanna celebrate my daughter's birthday. Let's stand up and celebrate. And people will join in singing with you. Why? People like to celebrate. 
When I was a student pastor in Georgia, uh, Christy and I were hosting some college students in our house. And so my daughter, Naomi, and I went to the grocery store to pick up snacks. And I'm, I'm getting chips and I'm getting dips and I'm getting Cokes and more chips and dips and frozen pizzas. And Naomi's like, oh, why are we getting all this food? And I said, Naomi, we're gonna have a party at our house. All the college students are coming over. Naomi was four years old. She stood up in the shopping cart. She stretched out her arms like she was on the front of the Titanic. And she yelled, everybody come to my house. <laughs> People like to party. Last week, Pastor Chad preached from Acts chapter four. He talked about the great fellowship that the early church had, uh, that they had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among uh, all as anyone had at need. They generously gave to one another and from house to house, they gathered together enjoying the favor of all men. You know what that sounds like to me? An ongoing celebration, it's a party. These early Christians lived out their faith every moment of their lives. They allowed the fact that Jesus had changed them to transform every part of their lives. They were allowing that new faith in Jesus to lead them in every area. And they were joyful and they were expressive. And as a result of that, they were all gathering, they were all worshiping together and they were, uh, they were uh, enjoying one another's company. They were partying. And then if we read the end of Acts 4, or, or that middle passage that Chad preached on last week, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Why? Because these early believers were living out their faith with great celebration and great joy. And that leads me to my final point. Hard celebration leads to more changed lives. Crowds of people in verse 12, they rushed in when they heard the celebration of the, the former crippled man. Now think about that. Think about this for just a minute in the context of the Great Commission. Before Jesus left the earth, he had looked at the, Peter and John and said, hey, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. And now Peter and John, they just healed this man. He's celebrating all these unsaved pagan people, all these unsaved, not followers of Jesus yet people came rushing in and they gathered around Peter and John. And we see how Peter responded in verse 12. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. So that began Peter's sermon. That's where we kind of left off. He said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we made this man walk by our own power or godliness? Peter saw his opportunity to tell other people about Jesus. And the crowd was full of questions. They wanted to know how Peter and John had made this man walk. So Peter told them about forgiveness of sins and hope in this guy called Jesus of Nazareth. He helped them understand that the power of Jesus healed the crippled man and that the power of Jesus can give them a new life as well too, a new spiritual life. He helped them understand that they could receive Jesus and be changed forever. See, the only reason why these people were there, and remember this, the only reason why they had gathered around was because of the celebration of the man who was once crippled and now could walk and leap and praise God. I love it when friends and family are invited to celebrate baptisms. We even heard today about the testimony of Pastor Mitch baptizing a, a child this summer and then the mother saying, you know what, it's time for me to follow. And the dad saying, you know what, it's time for me to follow the Lord in baptism. See, they celebrated their child's baptism and they were drawn to Jesus as well. We saw that happen on two or three occasions over the summer. An invitation to celebrate our faith in Jesus can result in more and more changed lives as well. So check it out. Peter took the opportunity. He told them about Jesus and then skipped to Acts 4, verse 4, as Peter wrapped up his sermon. Here's how it ends. 
But many of those, who were the those? Those were the ones that heard the man celebrating and they came in. Many of those who had heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Only counting the men was 5,000. There were women, there were children, uh, there were elderly that were not counted among the men. That means now the early church had grown to this point to about 20,000 believers because of the faith and the celebration of this crippled man that couldn't stop praising and celebrating. Do you see that? It's beautiful. God has wired us to celebrate. God has wired us to party. And all we've got to do is glorify him as we celebrate. So as you party and as you celebrate in Havasu, remember, celebrate because we've experienced new life in Jesus. Now, see, so what do we have to celebrate, right? What do we have to celebrate in a world that's filled with the coronavirus and a world that's full of political division and fear mongering right now? Well, here's a, here's a few reasons that, that Christians, followers of Jesus can celebrate. See, we can celebrate because Jesus defeated sin. Right? We can celebrate. We can celebrate because Jesus has defeated death. And you and I may die, but when we die, we're in a blink of an eye, we're gonna be in the presence of God forever. Jesus has defeated death. We can celebrate because Jesus holds the key to life and death in his hands. We can celebrate because Jesus has defeated hopelessness. He's defeated loneliness. He's defeated addictions. He's defeated fears. He has defeated worries. He has defeated depression. We can celebrate because Jesus has sent us his Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us. See, followers of Jesus can celebrate because we know for certain we will be in heaven when we die. We can celebrate because not, because not one thing will ever be able to separate followers of Jesus from the love of God that he has for us. You can't separate yourself from... Other people can't separate yourself from God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so we can celebrate and we can celebrate in a world that is rioting because we have eternal peace. We can celebrate because all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we get to celebrate life, that we get to celebrate Jesus. Thank you that we get to celebrate salvation and forgiveness. We get to celebrate eternal life. We get to celebrate hope. We get to celebrate peace. Thank you, Father, that we get to celebrate you. We look to you. You are the creator of all things. You are good to us. And Lord, we are so undeserving. Thank you for the mercy that you show to us. Thank you for the forgiveness that you provide. And thank you for the life change that you bring to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, if God is at work in your heart today, if you've never trusted in Jesus, we have our prayer team that will be here at the front and they would love to lead you to that life-changing relationship with God through Jesus Christ so that you can experience forgiveness and hope and be born again. So at the close of our last song, our prayer team will be here. You make your way down and you ask for prayer and they will, they will help you find that relationship with Jesus. Let's worship.